in our own community. Mark chapter 16, beginning with verse 9. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. This is the word of the Lord. Father, add your blessing to its reading. Anoint me to convey what you want to say to us. Touch every ear to hear. Not as I speak, but as you speak. Help us to be more than hearers, but active doers when we leave this place. In Jesus' name. Everybody said together. Amen. 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 You can be seated. Again, thank you for being here. If this is your first time, I need to give a quick disclaimer. Or if this is your first time in a long time, I don't normally teach quite as much as this morning, but I, we got to address a few things biblically, and then we'll then we'll preach. I promise, okay? But and if you've been around a Pentecostal church at all, we struggle with teaching. I don't know what's why that is, but we do. We struggle with people teaching. Like, why don't you start hollering? And anyway, listen, I can't I can't preach this text without hollering. So just give me a minute. It's not because I intend to holler. I really don't like to holler. It, it's just who I am. But just just hear me for just a second. Let me teach, okay? This particular passage of Scripture is one that has long been questioned of its validity. Actually, from the very beginning of the New Testament church, Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20, have been questioned by Bible scholars. It's been questioned by church leaders. It's been questioned by believers throughout ages. In fact, depending upon the translation of Scripture that you're reading from, and I hope that you have a Bible that you're bringing with you and not just trusting me to read to you what it says and not just trusting me to preach to you the truth of it and not just trusting that our media works. You need a Bible. And if you don't have a Bible, we'll be glad to get you a Bible before you leave today. It is the infallible Word of God. And you can't go through life without it. Listen, you, can know, you cannot be more spiritual than you are scriptural as they like to say in church. And, uh, and I would also argue that, uh, that you can't know God unless you know God. And to know God is to know the Word of God because He is the Word, the living Word. All that said to say, this Bible, depending upon the translation of Scripture that you're reading from, Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20, may be completely omitted. It might not even be in your Bible today. It is recorded in the New King James Version Bible. It's also recorded in most new translations of the Word of God as a footnote. And there's various reasons that I just don't have time to deal with all of it today, but let me just give you the cliff note version of why that is. It's actually because the oldest Greek manuscripts that we have to date, when I say we, all of us, the people of the world, that we have to date don't include these verses of Scripture in Mark's text. They are not there. However, because of this idea, many people think that these were added and should not be considered as part of God's Word. But there's also a group of people who lean to this idea that because of early Christian church leaders dating back to like A.D. 100, I mean like so from the beginning of the New Testament church, they begin to recognize and teach and talk about these particular verses in Mark's gospel. We have record, historical record, not the early manuscripts, but historical record where early church fathers, early church leaders, pastors if you will, would teach from these particular verses of the scripture. These same people also believe that there's no way possible that Mark, a disciple of Jesus, would have ended his letter so abruptly with the fact that those who loved Jesus didn't go off and tell people about Jesus. They, they just seem to cannot, they struggle with the idea that Mark would have just stopped because the people of God were afraid. You can go read it in verse 8. Mark 16, verse 8. And so these people believe, you know what? Because we have historical context that teaches us that this text was there because we have this reason to believe that Mark would have continued to complete his thought. Those folks choose to accept this as the Word of God. I fall somewhere in the middle of it, to be honest with you. 
And here's my reason, if you'll allow me the homiletical liberty. I, I believe that these verses must have somewhat been lost, if you'll allow me to say it like that, from uh, the original manuscript, which they might have been misplaced. These particular pieces of paper, these particular stones, whatever it was back then, this papyrus on scroll, must have been, potentially, is my thought, must have been uh, placed in a certain, another area or whatnot, but I accept them as the Word of God because the other two synoptic, synoptic gospels, that is Matthew and Luke, share the same events post-resurrection of Jesus. And their counterpart, John, who is considered the disciple that Jesus loved, share the very same stories. So all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, testify of the scriptures that we've read this morning and the scriptures that we'll read in the next couple of weeks. And Mark just happens to put it in a really concise way that I think all of you probably wish I could too. All right? Somebody called me last week and they said, uh, hey, I was watching on YouTube Sunday and uh, I just want to tell you your 11 o'clock sermon was the best sermon I think I've ever heard you preach. And I was thinking like, man, that's very kind of you. And then I realized I didn't preach last week. <laughs> and he starts laughing like all of you are, you know, the Holy Ghost of heaven just took over the altar service. And uh, I did give the points because I said, you know, we, two services, I can't can't preach to nine o'clock when I don't preach here. So I, I just gave him out real, real fast and it was the end of it. I mean, like it was the quickest sermon I've ever given, I'm sure. And he said, I think it was the best one you've ever preached. Anyway, if you're watching right now, I love you, brother. I love you. I'm praying for you, but I love you. <laughs> that being said, I think we need to be very careful to direct and meet culture right where it is because there are people, there is an agenda of folks who are questioning the infallibleness of God's word. There are people in today's world who are questioning the inerrancy of God's word. There are people who are questioning how men of old could have been moved on by the Holy Spirit of heaven. And they're questioning whether, it, whether or not it is the holy writ of God. Listen to what I'm telling you. Heaven and earth will pass away, it says of itself, but my word will remain forever. Listen, this is not to confuse us, but this is for us to understand and for us to get some clarity on what God's word really is. It's for us to discover Discover the principles of his word and for us to discover the power of his word. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. These things really did happen. These accounts really are true things that I've have, have identified our history. These things are just as important to all of us as though George Washington was the first president of the United States. If we're going to teach that in our school, we ought to teach biblical history as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> You know, I, I'll be honest, I need to move on. Uh, I, I'll just say it like this and let me just hurry. Uh, even if we don't preach that Jesus or teach in our schools, I'm not talking about church because we're just taking them all out of it, okay? Please hear what I'm saying right now. But even if we don't teach Jesus as the Savior like we preach and know that he is, the least you could do was tell the real history of our world. Right? The very least you could do is say he was a real man and he really did do these things. Because you know what? It's not my job to convict the sinner of sin. It's not my job to convict the righteous of righteousness. It's the Holy Ghost of heaven's job. So if you'll just tell the story, he'll take care of the rest. It's just how I feel about it. Anyway, I need to move on. So we find ourselves in this place where we've got to address these things. The schools aren't, the courthouses aren't, and many families are not, so the church has to. This is the infallible word of God, brothers and sisters. The infallible word of God. Mary Magdalene, Mary of Magdala, it's where she would have come from. That's how they, Magdalene means of where she was from. Mary of Magdala, Mary Magdalene had this incredible encounter with Jesus. And it's not just mentioned in Mark chapter 16. But in fact, it's mentioned in John chapter 20 and verses 11 through 18, and I don't have time to deal with it all today, but it's really a dramatic story, really a dramatic encounter that she had with Jesus. Remember in verses uh, 7 through 8 of Mark chapter 16, Mary's, not Mary Magdalene, but other Mary's, and Salome had come to the temple. The angel of the Lord they saw, and they, the angel said, the, you're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He's not here. He's risen. We dealt with all that last week. The angel said, go and tell him. 
that he's risen just like he said he would, they were disobedient. They did not do what the angel of the Lord told them to do. Mary of Magdala, Mary Magdalene, shows up to the tomb. The Bible here doesn't give us any indication that she saw an angel, but that she saw an empty tomb. And here, she sees Jesus. In John chapter 20, I ain't got time to deal with it all, but you can go read it. She sees Jesus, but she doesn't recognize him. It's kind of like one time I was uh, at a Southern Gospel concert and I ran into an old friend who I've known my whole life. I've known him as Uncle Paul growing up. And he said, hey, let's do something. Let's call your dad from my phone. Him and my dad have been longtime buds. He said, let's call your dad from my phone. And I'm just going to tell him somebody's here to talk to him. And, and, uh, and you just pick up the phone and talk. I said, okay. So the music's going, all this stuff. You know, it's loud. It's all this. So Uncle Paul calls my dad. Hey, Bruce, I'm standing here with a longtime friend. Hadn't seen him in a long time, man. So good, blah, 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 blah. He wants to talk to you. I just pick up the phone and say, hey. Dad's response, hey, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good. We carry on a minute or two conversation. I don't know how long it was. Finally, my dad says, who is this? (laughs) First time in my life, my dad did not know who I was on the phone right there. I've never forgot it. Immediately, this is what I said, Daddy. He said, Joshua, what you doing with Uncle Paul's phone? (laughs) Go read John chapter 20. Powerful passage of scripture. Mary did not know Jesus, but Jesus knew Mary. And he called her by name. I want you to hear me say something today. You are not a number to God. He knows you by name. And the Bible says in John chapter 20 that he spoke her name. And immediately she knew him to be the one that she had known. Hear what I'm telling you. My dad and I have a relationship that when I call him daddy or he calls me Joshua in that tone or that way, there's just something that we know one another personally and intimately. We know each other. And there's no doubt. There's no question. And I want you to know that's exactly exactly the kind of relationship Mary had with God and that's the very relationship God wants to have with you so that you know him by name and he knows you by name it matters brothers and sisters you may be saved but you have to respond to the resurrected Christ Jesus there has to be something more Mary believed. Mary knew what he said. Luke chapter 8 tells us that Mary was a woman who supported the mission, supported the ministry of Jesus, specifically like tithes and offerings. That's a pretty powerful subject. Another message for another time. So this Mary of Magdala, this Mary Magdalene, we know her as, she knew him. She believed him. She trusted him. No doubt she had heard him talk about being crucified and She probably was there the day he was. And now, supposing him to have been the gardener, he calls her by name. And this dramatic story begins to unfold, a beautiful one. And then we read in Mark chapter 16 that she was the one whom Jesus had cast seven demons from her. Luke 8 and 2 tells us that she was the one who had been delivered from demon possession. And so then I go to the sermon guide on the back of your bulletin today. I want to tell you that Jesus reveals himself to the unlikely. Jesus reveals himself to the unlikely. I begin to think about that in verse 9. The Bible says, Now when he arose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. There's a lot of cultural things here. Again, just don't have time to address today. You're just going to have to trust me, and you can check me. Okay, always check me. Google it, whatever you need to do. But it was culturally unacceptable, socially unacceptable for him to have appeared to a woman to begin with. In America, women have the same rights as men. Thank God for it. I'm proud of it. Believe in it. Nothing wrong with it. But in Jewish custom and culture, that was unacceptable. Absolutely unacceptable. What should have happened according to the law, what should have happened, and I know this because of other scripture, what should have happened is Jesus should have showed up to the temple where the Jewish and religious leaders were, and he should have said, ta-da, told you so. (laughs) You tore it down, I rebuilt it this morning. I've got the keys of death, hell, and the grave. I'm victorious. I'm the one who you have been looking for. That's what should have happened. You know, my daddy used to say, thank God I'm not God, right? That's what should have happened. Then he should have smited every one of them. Yeah. Told you so. 
But instead, he defied all the odds. He went against the culture. He went against all this stuff. And he showed up to marry a woman. But not just a woman. A woman who had been known as a demon-possessed, devil-possessed woman. A woman who had been known by her past and her history. One of the most unlikely people. And I begin to think about other unlikely people, Dr. Man, they have in the scriptures, and I couldn't help but think of Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah both were old people. And God the Father said in the Old Testament, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. And Abraham said, but I have no children. And God said, but I made a promise. And if, as we said last week, if God said it, you can believe it. It may not come when you want it. Ah, uh, but he'll be there right on time, the old songwriter said. Yeah, we used to shout in the Pentecostal church to that one because he's an on-time God. Yes, he is. And so all of a sudden, Abraham and Sarah become pregnant with the promise of God, and then they give birth to a child of God, and then all of a sudden now unlikely people have seen God's revelation. Unlikely people have witnessed God and the power of his authority and his might. Not just Abraham and Sarah when they were old, but then I begin to think about a stuttering and a murdering Moses. Now he's left the people of Egypt where who had raised him and cared for him, and now he's come to uh, the backside of a wilderness tending to his father-in-law's flock. He's kind of still running for his life, and there, who does not have eloquent speech, and there a man who is literally taking the life of another is sitting back just thinking all of his uh, all of his future is done away with all of his future is gone but there God saw him and there God appeared to him and there God revealed himself the Bible says in the form of a burning bush that was not consumed and there God said Moses take off your shoes because where you stand is on holy ground and I've got an assignment for you and I've got a calling for you you know what that is that's Jesus that's God revealing himself to unlikely people I could not help but think about the prostitute Rahab. Oh, there's a few women in this room. You wouldn't want us to put all of your story up on this screen because it would be embarrassing. You'd have to walk out of here with your head tucked down. But you got a story a little bit like Rahab. Rahab was known by everybody in Jericho. Rahab was known as that one who went from this house to that. There's proverbs about Rahab, brothers and sisters. You got to be careful because she's sly. She sneaks from here to there in the middle of the night. She goes parancing, uh, parading herself in, in clothing that's ungodly. Rahab was was a woman who was the least unlikely people. But you go to the New Testament, the genealogy of Jesus, and the woman who's there, her name is Rahab. You know why? Because God reveals himself to the most unlikely people. I'm not just going to talk about women. Let's talk about the man, right? Samson, who he knew better, but he laid his head in the lap of a promiscuous woman. She had lulled him in. She had enticed him. And then he begins to tell her things that should have been hidden. Some things that were secrets of God that nobody else was supposed to know and what happened as he laid his hat laid his head in the lap of a woman that he should not have been with to begin with or not should have been there and that kind of act as he went to sleep under her caress the philistines came in cut his hair and then all of the promises of god were taken away all of his strength was lost i don't have time to preach it just go trust me and believe it and read it for yourself and but yet but yet, in the last moments of his life, sat in shackled and in chain in the pillars, he called aloud to Jesus and said, God, I know who you were, and I'm asking you to give me strength one more time. And the most unlikely person who was unworthy and unacceptable before God, God says, that's the kind of man I want to reveal myself to. And in the strength, not of Samson, but of God, he began to push until the pillars gave way and until God got the victory, not just Rahab or a guilty man like Samson. Oh, but think about the boy who was left out of the draft. Think about him. Think about the boy who kept getting passed up over and over and over and over and over again. Samuel the prophet comes to the father's house of David. And now here the Samuel the prophet says, I want you to call all your boys together because God said the next king of Israel is here. Think about what happened. True story. There's seven of them, and his daddy calls six. Now, if you've ever felt outcast or unloved, that would do it right there. Because there's no way, there's no way that the ruddy boy, there's no way that the youngest boy, there's no way 
that the boy who smells like sheep dung and who keeps talking about wanting this music ministry, there's no way it could be him. So Samuel the prophet takes his flask of oil and he passes one by one by one. And he looks to the father and he says, I know that I know that I know that I know. And God said, from your house is coming the next king. But I don't see him. And so his daddy says, hmm, run by them one more time. My pastor would say, don't know it, but since I'm preaching, I'm going to preach it my way. You ready? I imagine his daddy said, check them one more time. Check them twice. I imagine his daddy kind of walked by checking some of their biceps. Some of them probably walked by talking about their pedigrees, where they had gone to college and where they had got their education. So he probably went and told them about how this one has been, uh, been pledged to marry that beautiful woman who would be a beautiful queen sitting beside the, you know, I don't know this, but I just wonder if daddy, who was really confident in the first six, because then what I do know is the prophet said, no, 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 no. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. <laughs> and he says, I'm going to stand right here until you bring that ruddy boy you keep talking about. And as soon as David walked in, the most unlikely person from one of the most unlikely places, Samuel said, that's him. And he began to pour the oil flask upon his head and anoint him. I feel the Holy Ghost of heaven. and began to anoint him as king. God reveals himself to the most unlikely people. Uh, I begin to think about blind Bartimaeus in the New Testament. Blind Bartimaeus was sitting there just as a beggar like he had been all his life. The commotion of the crowd began to get there, and blind Bartimaeus says, who is it? And they said, it's Jesus of Nazareth. And Brother Mike, uh, the, the testimony had already heard, been heard about what Jesus was doing. And so all of a sudden, he begins to cry aloud, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowd began to hush him because, you know, blind Bartimaeus is one of them unlikely people. I, you know, I guess the crowd must have thought of Jesus that he was like a televangelist, right? You know, if you don't have anything to offer me, I don't have anything to offer you. You send me a $1,000 gift, and I'll send you a little prayer vial that said to come from somewhere. I, Lord, God, help me. I I need to quit meddling. I need to move on. Don't fall prey to the wolves in sheep clothing. And I'm not saying that all people on television are that. Because listen, there are some good God-fearing women and men preaching the good news, the gospel of Jesus, unadulterated, uncompromised. Thank God for them. But don't fall prey to those that are muddy in the waters either. You understand what I'm saying? I got to move on. I got to move on. All that said to say, they, these people, these religious people must have thought that about Jesus because they kept trying to hush Bartimaeus. But Bartimaeus kept saying, no, no, no. You try to quiet me, but I no, I've heard what he can do. I've heard who he is. And so all the louder he began to get. And finally Jesus said, I've had enough of all of you. Bring him to me. Bring him to me. The most unlikely person from one of the most unlikely places. Jesus revealed himself to him right there and he says, son, you can go your way because your faith has made you whole. He put his hands on his eyes and in that very moment, I began to think about the leper in the New Testament that as Jesus was just walking through the wilderness with his disciples, as was customary, the leper began to cry out, unclean, unclean. And Jesus said, ah, oh, but he doesn't know I'm the one that can clean. He doesn't know that I'm the one that can take care of every need he's ever had. And so as, was he, as he should, this old boy just hollered, I'm unclean. I'm unclean, I'm unclean. And Jesus said, yeah, but today you have an encounter with me. Today I'm going to reveal myself to the most unlikely people. And you can't preach that without talking about the woman at the well. Amen. Here's this woman who got up to be somewhere where she should not have been at that time. And here's Jesus to go somewhere that he should not have been at that time. Why? Because the woman didn't want to be seen. But Jesus saw her before she ever got there and Jesus knew where she was going and Jesus had an appointment with her and she had an appointment with him that she was not even aware of. She was thirsty. She was thirsty. She was going to get the water from the well before all the other women got there because she was known in the city and if she was there when all the other women were there, they'd talk about her. They must have been good church women. Might as well just preach it, hadn't I? Might as well just, you know what women, no, God, let, not just women. Men do the same thing. Let me deal with it. We call it prayer requests. It's gossip, honey. Don't ask me what I need prayer for if you're not going to petition the throne room of heaven for me. 
It ain't none of your business what's going on in my life privately unless you are only going to take it to the one that can change it. That's the only one that matters. That's good preaching. That's good preaching. <laughs> Pastor EJ, oh, just bring me an application from audio tomorrow. I might need it. <laughs> Where was I at? Talking about church people. Talking about church people. Religious people. One guy left the 9 o'clock service. He said, I think you were trying to say something like churchianity a while ago. I said, hmm, that cut deep. He said, yeah, I think too many of us are good churchians. Too many of us could really profess churchianity because we're good at religious, religiosity, religion. But we're not very good at relationship. We're not very good at recognizing who he is. But the woman at the well had an, God help me, the woman at the well had an encounter with a man who could change everything. He was going to reveal himself to the most unlikely person because the woman at the well had been married five times. Been married five times, and as she's talking to Jesus, she says, you shouldn't be talking to me, a woman. Y'all remember that now. That's unlikely to begin with. They're from different cultures, different sects of, of groups of people. He shouldn't have been talking to her. But then he says, you've spoken well, because you've been married five times, and the man you're living with now, you shacked up with, ain't your husband. And you know what? We in church, in American church today, we want to leave that part out like it ain't no. Listen, it's a sin, brothers and sisters. You got to deal with it. Jesus dealt with it right where she was. Okay, right where she was. He wasn't being mean. He wasn't being critical. He wasn't being. Uh, he wasn't criticizing. But he was saying, "You're lost." But if you'll if you'll listen, you're about to be found. I know who you are. I know right where you are, and I love you anyhow. You know what that is? That's Jesus revealing himself to the most unlikely people. He said to her, he said, you give me a little water now to quench my physical thirst. But if you'll trust me today, if you'll trust me today, I'm going to give you water from a well that will never run dry, that you will never thirst again. And in that moment, the Bible says she went, my, I feel the Holy Ghost, she went leaping into town, come see a man, come see a man that told me all that I ever was, all that I'd ever done, and all that I ever could be, and all that I ever would be in him. He testifies of a living water, and she began to witness and testify of all that he had done for her. You know what that is? Jesus reveals himself to unlikely people. And number two, great witness comes from great forgiveness. Let me say that again. Great witness comes from great forgiveness. Let's go back to Mark chapter 16 now, verses 7 through 8. Yeah, verse 8. The angel of the Lord said, y'all go tell Peter and the disciples that just as Jesus said, and this is North Georgia talk, just as Jesus said, he's done. And he's going to go before y'all and meet you in the city. And the churchianity folks, the churchians, didn't believe, and so they were disobedient and didn't go tell. We dealt with it last week. I need to move on. Then... Then he showed up to the most unlikely person named Mary Magdalene, revealed himself to her, and she went and told everybody. Jesus showed up at the well, and she went and told everybody. And yet, there's another thought that I just got to deal with because I believe Pastors who have been well met have taught and preached this the wrong way, myself included. If you've ever heard me preach it, let me correct myself. As you grow in the Word of God, you learn, okay? I've learned a few things. Let me correct what I believe to be true of the Bible. In Matthew chapter 26 and in Mark chapter 14, these writers tell us of the anointing of Jesus at Bethany. In Simon the leper's home. The Bible says that this woman, who many of us would refer to as Mary in her alabaster box, not in Matthew 26 and Mark 14, this woman's nameless. She's, name's never given. 
And she shows up, yes, in Bethany, but at Simon the leper's home. While he's sitting with some religious leaders, the who's who of the church. And the Bible says she took this spikenard, which would have been worth about 300 denarii, a year's wages, most Bible scholars would argue. And she anointed him prematurely for burial. If you study the timeline, it's probable that this particular event happened on Holy Wednesday, just literally hours before he was betrayed by Judas, just hours before he was crucified by the Roman soldiers, just hours before uh, they took him to a borrowed tomb, just literally hours before he was resurrected. Wednesday to Friday, Wednesday to Sunday, I mean, just days, hours and in these particular passages of Scripture, this nameless woman breaks this spikenard bottle of perfume and she anoints his head. And religious leaders ask why she would go to such expense. I'm about to preach. Because this could have been saved and given to the poor. But Jesus said, let her be. For you'll always have the poor, but she's done something good unto me. She's anointed me for burial. Ah, uh, but now we go to Gospel of John, chapter 12. And this is where we get the word Mary from. This is where we start putting the pieces together. But this Mary is in Bethany because that's where she lives. She is the Mary of Bethany. She's the sister to Martha and Lazarus. Y'all remember her? She's the one the Bible says sat at the feet of Jesus. When Martha was up busy about God's work. She was the one who Martha said, Jesus, tell her to get up and get busy. So now, Lazarus, Jesus' friend, who had died, where Jesus had wept. I'm trying to hurry, but this is too good not to say it. Now, Jesus and his homeboys, his disciples, are strolling back through Bethany again. And they heard, the brother and sisters heard of his visit to their town. And they said, bid Jesus to come. We want to have a dinner with him. So Jesus and the disciples show up to Lazarus' house where they're sitting. And in John chapter 12, Mary of Bethany pulls out a bottle of spikenard. You see the similarities here where it could really be misconstrued as one event, Right? But this was not, according to the timeline, according to what most Bible scholars would argue to be true, this wasn't Holy Wednesday. This was actually just days before Passover, a different time, two different homes. Go read it. Go read it. It's got to be two different accounts of anointing. One who was a nameless woman, most Bible scholars would actually say is Mary Magdalene. But because she had been known as the demon-possessed woman, those gospel writers would not identify her. Mary, who had been known as Jesus' friend of Bethany, she could be recognized because they were elite people. And so now Mary of Bethany shows up, and she doesn't break the spike in our jar over, uh, over uh, Jesus' head. Now she gets down on her hands and her knees, and she breaks this uh, high-dollar ointment oil, and she breaks it all over his feet, and she begins to wipe her hair and wipe her hair on Jesus' feet so that she could dry up the oil and so she could worship and she could praise. And here, it's not a religious leader, but here it's Judas Iscariot, John chapter 12, go read it, who the Bible says betrayed Jesus later on, and he asked the same question. Why have you uh, uh, given all of this to him right now when it could have been saved and used? And Jesus responded much like he did to the other religious leader of the day. He said, no, 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 you'll have the poor forever, but she has done something for me today. Let her be. And John chapter 12 says it plainly. You can go read it. This is not me preaching. Jesus said it was not because Judas cared for the poor, but it was because he governed the treasury. Josh Edwards paraphrased, but it's all in the Bible. Because he governed the treasury, and he wanted to know why you didn't sell that good oil so that that money could have been put in the treasury so that he could go get him a new pair of golf clubs, so he could go get him a new wardrobe, so that he could go get him a new horse and chariot. And the list goes on and on and on and on, and on of why Judas may have wanted the gift. 
But you know what both of these ladies had in common? If Bible scholars are correct, which I choose to believe they are, that the first in Matthew 26 and Mark 14 was Mary Magdalene. They just left her nameless. She knew what it meant to be possessed by the devils of hell. And you get over to John chapter 12, Mary of Bethany. She knew what it meant to be oppressed by the affairs of the world. And like Miss Cece would sing, you weren't there the night he found me. You did not feel what I felt when he wrapped his loving arms around me. I can about hear Mary Magdalene or the nameless woman saying, oh, no, 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 you don't know the cost of the oil. I, I say you don't know the cost of my praise. Oh, I can't sing it nowhere like Miss Cece. I wish she was here. I'd just give her a mic. We'd go to church. You don't know the cost of the oil in my alabaster box. Because she knew what it was like to have been possessed of hell and nothing, nothing she could do physically could conquer that which was against her spiritually. Everything she had tried, everywhere she had looked, it was just absolute torment, absolute hell on earth. I'm not cussing, I'm just good preaching right here. And this woman knew what it was like to be bound in the chains of sin. She knew what it was like to be bound in the chains of, uh, of possession. Oh, but you go to John chapter 12. And yet, the Bible says he waited four days to show up to Lazarus' too. And the Bible says in John chapter 11, he stinketh. That's what the word of God says he stinketh and yet now Mary this woman who had worshipped him before is watching as he and waiting for him to call her brother by name they rolled the stone away and she was there when she knew her brother was dead even beyond life and yet Jesus called him by name Lazarus come forth he began to hobble out another message for another time his friends loosed him from their grave his grave clothes and they went on their way. So in Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 26 and in Mark chapter 14, you've got a woman who had been possessed by the devil, potentially and perhaps, and she was worshiping him. And she was thankful, not because she wanted others to see it, because it did not matter the cost to her physically, because he had done more for her than she could ever repay. And yet in John chapter 12, there was another woman who says, I can testify that he once was dead, but now he lives. I can testify that the God in whom I've served loves me and cares for me and knows me. You know what? That woman had been oppressed by grief and by depression and by anxiety and by fear. But this woman knew now that I need to worship him who alone is worthy. May I testify to somebody today, your greatest witness comes from those who have forgiven the most. Listen to me. Many of us church folks get real comfortable as long as everybody else around us is worshiping like us. Mm. Mm. For in fact, I do love you, and I have chosen you right where you are, says the Lord. I have a plan for your life that is beyond your wildest dream. I today do want to show you who I am. I want to prove to you that I am worthy, not because of what I have done for others, but because of what I want and will do for you, says the Lord. I sense this in my spirit. If you're here today without a Pentecostal background, the Lord has spoken to us through tongues and interpretation of tongues. Gifts of God, I sense it in my spirit. Confirmation of his word, I feel it oh so strong. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We love you, we honor you, we praise you, we worship you. We worship you, we worship you, we worship you. Oh, let it be God. The Lord now wants to reveal himself to you in a powerful way. But hear the Lord, I, I, I sense this strongly, hear the Lord. It is not for us to question the motives of people. It is not for us to question someone else's praise. It is not for us to question someone else's witness. 
Because those who have been forgiven much will witness much. Like the woman at the well, like Mary Magdalene, who had been freed, who had been set apart. Oh, you weren't there. You didn't know the cost of the oil. Brothers and sisters, I want you to hear what the Lord is confirming to us today as the praise team and band come. Your oil matters most to you because of what he has done and what he will do in your life today. And finally, I need you to hear, not everyone will believe. Mary Magdalene, of heaven, Mary Magdalene of old went. She testified that she had not just seen an angel, but she had seen him, the one she knew to be the deliverer, the one that she knew to be the one who frees, the one she knew to be able to do exceedingly abundantly of all she could ever ask or think. And yet when she went to the disciples who had known him before, they didn't believe. You know what the Bible teaches in the end times, which we are quickly approaching? The signs of the times are appearing everywhere. Pray for Israel, brothers and sisters. We must pray for Israel. The signs of the times are appearing everywhere before us. And the Bible says that in the end times, there will be a great falling away. But I am convinced that it doesn't have to be me. It doesn't have to be you. It doesn't have to be our family. Because the same Bible that tells me of this great falling away is the same Bible that says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That same good news, that same gospel of Jesus, that same Bible says he is not slow concerning his promise as some may count it. For he will that none perish, but that all come unto repentance. The golden text of all the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You may feel like the least worthy person. People around you may have told you you were the most unlikely candidate for anything good. You may have tried to please her. You may have tried to please him. You may have tried to please them. You may have done this or that. But everything you've tried to do has all been, enough, been for absolutely nothing. I want you to hear what I believe God has confirmed to us through his servant today. He reveals himself to people just like you. And I want you to know, brothers and sisters, if he'd do it for me, he'll do it for you. I promise you. He's no respecter of people. But you know what? Our job is not to make them believe. Our job is just to tell them what we've seen and what we've experienced and encountered. Because even Jesus said to his early disciples, you go and tell them, and if they don't receive you, shake the dust from your feet. It's the Holy Ghost's job to convict them. It's your job to tell them. My job to tell them. But we can't grow weary in well-doing. Because if you're like me, there's a lot of people who have chosen not to accept what you're selling. Who've chosen not to accept what you've been trying to tell them is true and real. Don't grow weary and well-doing. You'll reap if you faint not. That's what the Bible says. If it's your spouse, you keep loving like Jesus. If it's your children, you keep loving like Jesus. If it's your colleague, you keep loving like Jesus. Yes, you do what you can, but don't just stop with them and give up. Go tell somebody else. Go witness how you once were lost, but now you're found, how you once were blind, but now you see how you once were a wretch, but now you've been redeemed and saved and restored. Go tell somebody about what Jesus has done for you. I was the least unlikely candidate. I 
told the story. Four years old, a stuttering problem. They kept me in, in, in from recess. That's why I'm no good as, as an athlete now. None at all. I didn't get to run much, but you know what they taught me to do? Talk. And some people would wish I'd stop. So help me, this is what I believe. I believe that was God prepping me, one of the most unlikely people, to do what I have to do today. Because God knew then he's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the one that sees our end from our beginning. You know what that was? That was God saying, I just need a mama and a daddy that I love. I just need a teacher that I love. I just need somebody to say, hey, boy, you're going to talk, and you're going to talk to a point you won't stop. Because God reveals himself to the most unlikely people. Those forgiven much will witness much. But we must not grow weary in well doing because everyone's just not going to believe. Keep doing it, but don't grow tired. Keep your head up. Press on, child of God. Your job's to tell them not to make them believe it and accept it. As we stand all over the room, for those physically able, the praise team's getting ready to lead us in one chorus of worship before we're dismissed. Pastor EJ's coming in a moment to lead our benediction. Thank you for being here. Thank you for allowing me the liberty to preach what I have felt so strongly in my spirit today. But here's the altar call. If you're in the room and you don't know Jesus, this is the day of salvation. I beg of you to surrender your heart to him. Believe it. Believe in your heart. That he is Lord, confess him as Lord of your life with your mouth. And our pastoral team would love to pray with you in this altar. We'd love just to pray with you and to help you begin the greatest journey of your life. And then, if you're in the room and you have any other need, physical, emotional, spiritual, finance, whatever it is, and you just need somebody to agree with you in prayer, the altars are open now. We're going to pray together. Come, let's worship the Lord.